Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our third virtual Teen Science Cafe of the school year. Um, before we begin, I just want to kind of go over how to like ask questions, et cetera, et cetera. If you do have any questions, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, just type in the chat and one of the moderators who I will introduce briefly um, will answer. And then um, also we're using the raise hand feature today. So if you have a question and you want to speak it aloud, feel free to do that at the end or when we prompt you. So um, just be a little flexible with that one. So without further ado, I'll introduce my co-moderator -mod Tamara Poles and our speaker Joanna Ramirez. We're going to talk real quickly about what kind of quarantine hobbies we've kind of undertaken over the last month or so and then I'll do the actual intro with the whole spiel for Joanna. So um, Joanna, what's what has your uh, quarantine hobby been this past month? Oh. Joanna, you're still so muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so this past month, my brothers and I have really gotten into uh, reality TV. So lots of old MTV, actually. We've been watching a lot of older seasons of a lot of shows, uh, which is really just fun to not be able to think about what's happening um, by using it as like escapism. Um, so that's been lots of fun to kind of bond over TV that we used to watch a lot when I was home um, permanently. Are these the kind of shows where they're like trapped in a house with like 10 <laughs> other people or is yeah. it like... I mean, one of them is um, Are You the One? So we watched like the first two seasons and that's uh, people trapped in a house trying to match make, like find their perfect match um, mm -hmm. to win lots and lots of money. So yeah. Okay. Nice. Well, nice. Tamara, what about you? I think that's a really appropriate thing to watch about people being trapped in a house. So <laughs> <laughs> I unfortunately, this is my party of a house. There's no one here. I just did not by myself. So the things that I've been keep uh, keeping myself busy is, uh, you know, wondering how many straws does it take to put in a can for me to drink from my couch to the can on the floor? Awesome. It's about 10. Um, how many Oreos can I eat? You know, cool things like that. <laughs> no, in just, a row or like? <laughs> um, that is to be determined, actually. That's currently in progress. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, I've been actually doing a lot of grilling because it's been super nice outside. And I don't cook very much. I'm one of those, I will go out to eat all the time, but now I can't do that. So um, I've been doing a lot of grilling and cooking stuff. But um, And also watching awesome Netflix shows, too, so. I got Good. you on that one, Joanna. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, so I know that I've kind of beaten this with a stick. I've talked about it so much, but I've been gardening. I may have had a little mishap because I planted some pumpkins and my quarantine buddy was like, well, they kind of take up a lot of space, so maybe be wary of planting pumpkins. And I'm like, oh, God, why not? Really. <laughs> So I planted what's called two hills. Like you plant five pumpkin seeds, seeds per hill. And then I found online, each Ooh. hill requires 50 to 100 square feet of space. So I was like, <laughs> I think I'm gonna have like a veritable pumpkin patch across like my yard, my neighbor's yard, maybe just like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Vines reaching into Durham. Yeah. <laughs> like breaking in through my window. I don't know. We'll see. I'm going to walk uh, out my, my front door and be like, oh, there's vines. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. It's like World of Worlds. Um, Great. Yeah. If, if anybody wants to go on like a pumpkin patch walk, you can probably come to my house. Nice. Uh, I actually thought that you were going to say that your mishap was that the pumpkins became carriages. Huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> all right, so I'll go ahead and introduce Joanna um, officially so we can get started. I know nobody wants to hear us just gobble on like a couple old hens, but uh, 
All right, so Joanna is a community outreach coordinator for the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Her role is to create and foster meaningful communication with communities to improve cancer outcomes across NC. And when she's not answering work emails, she loves to read and apparently hang out with her bros all the time. <laughs> so without further ado, I will let you take it. And uh, also participants, feel free to um, throw in your hobbies in the Q&A. We'll probably read them out periodically. Um, or yeah, do the race hand feature at the end. Like we want to hear about it. Um, but yeah, without further ado, Joanna, take it away. I'm gonna unmute myself, or unmute myself and disappear for a little while. <laughs> All right. Um, hi everyone. So I have some slides that I will be um, there we go. So today we're going to talk about life in the times of COVID-19. Um, this felt very salient. Uh, as Cole told you, I actually work in cancer research, so this is not uh, specifically my field, but I um, want to talk to you guys about it. Uh, so first we're going to go through uh, what is COVID-19? What does it mean? Uh, why are we currently socially being socially distanced? How is this affecting our mental health? And what can we do to help support each other during this time? Uh, and also don't forget to ask your questions using the Q&A button. So a little bit more about me. So I grew up in North Carolina. I went to high school in Concord High, uh, home of the spiders. Um, I went to Davidson College for undergrad. I was an English and pre-med major because I thought I was going to go to medical school. Uh, but then I decided I really needed to take a break to figure out what I wanted to do. So I ended up working at Peace Haven Community Farm, which is in Whitsett, North Carolina, which is um, between Greensboro and Burlington, um, for those of you who know the area. And this is a community farm um, and a home for adults with disabilities. I was there for almost a year and then I decided to get back closer to the healthcare field. So I became a certified nurse aide. Um, I worked in hospice and palliative care and I, um, <laughs> um, and I uh, worked at Levine, the Levine Cancer Institute. I was a research assistant doing all kinds of things, just kind of learning, you know, what cancer research even was which then led me to come back to you or go to UNC for the first time. I went to the Gilling School of Global Public Health uh, where I studied public health, um, specifically health behavior, which we learned is more of an approach to learning how, um, how people think about health and how they react to health choices. And there's all kinds of different um, fields you could go into. So if you have any questions about what public health even is or how my journey went from I was pre-med to then ended up in public health. Like, feel free to ask those questions. I'm very open about um, how I landed there. Um, and now I am working at the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center doing community outreach and engagement. Um, so and if you have questions about that too, also please feel free to ask. I'm very open about any of that. So let's get started. Um, what is COVID-19? I'm sure y'all have heard tons of information. It's on the news. It's everything that everybody is talking about. Um, but you know, it's really hard to understand sometimes what the news is saying, or if you try to read about it on the internet, not everything is like really easy to follow. It's a lot of jargon. So I'm just gonna try to break it down a little bit. Um, so these are some images or illustrations of what COVID-19 looks like. Uh, so it's actually, it comes from, the name comes from uh, coronavirus, so that's COVID, and the D is from disease, 19, because that's when it was discovered, um, and it's caused by SARS-CoV-2, and that's just the family of viruses that it's in. I don't know if y'all have heard about um, the SARS virus like that. There was an outbreak a couple years ago, so you might have heard about that on the news as well. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the coronavirus, although it is not the only coronavirus. Um, the name actually comes from, if you can see on the screen, there's like tiny, those tiny little, they look like little crowns that are covering the virus. Um, and that's where the name coronavirus actually comes from. 
So how does it spread? It actually spreads from water droplets that's either from your nose or from your mouth uh, that come out of your body when you're breathing, when you're coughing, when you're sneezing. Basically just being around anywhere you get water droplets everywhere that stick on surfaces and that's where the viruses live um, because all viruses actually need a host. So if they stay on the surface, they can't live for very long until they go into another living body, um, which is animals or humans. And um, if you know anything about viruses, they actually replicate, which means they make more of themselves, by hijacking a cell's DNA, which means that they, once they enter your body, they go into your tiny cells and they basically like destroy it and then they inject their DNA into your DNA and so then your cell actually becomes a virus making machine. Um, so it turns into like a factory and so like now your individual cells are actually creating more virus cells. Um, so it's different from bacteria, it's different from other kinds of diseases um, or infectious diseases that you can get. Um, and as you probably know, symptoms range from respiratory illness, fever, cough, difficulty breathing. Um, so this is the basic outline that I'm going to go through. If you want to learn more, uh, How Stuff Works actually has really good uh, resources that are really easy to read and easy to follow. Um, you can also go to the New York Times. All of their coronavirus articles are now free for anyone who wants to read them. Um, the CDC, which is the Centers for Disease Control, has had a lot of really great resources as well. World Health Organization, um, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and if you know, if you want to know something interesting about me, when I was really, really young, like really, really young, like maybe like 10, um, when computers were first coming into people's homes, because that was a long time ago, um, I don't know that, I know that y'all probably don't understand uh, what that was, but when we got our first computer, uh, I used to play this game called Pandemic. Um, now there's a game called Pandemic that's a board game, which is very different. The board game, you're trying to stop a pandemic from happening. The online game, you're trying to create a pandemic. So I had so much fun deciding on what kind of pandemic I wanted to create. And the goal is to infect and kill as many people um, before you create a vaccine that stops you. Uh, it's very fun. Um, to play and you kind of you learn about how viruses and bacteria and how pandemics actually happen. Um, so that will be that's a pretty fun game to play. So I really want to talk to you about why are we socially distant? Why are we social distancing um, and why it's important? So social distancing is um, we've been asked to maintain physical distance from people in places. We've been told to stay six feet away from people to not meet in big groups and to stay home. Um, this is different from quarantine because quarantine is specifically when you're separating people out because they may have already been exposed to a disease or they already have a disease. Social distancing is hopefully the step before that to prevent people from getting the disease. Um, so why is this important? As I said, uh, this virus lives in these air droplets um, and this is an image of somebody sneezing in slow motion. So as you can see, those water droplets that are being expelled from your mouth, they can go pretty far. Um, if you're not covering your mouth when you're sneezing or when you're coughing, uh, they land on a ton of surfaces and all it takes is for you, somebody else to come behind you and touch something that you've sneezed on and now they put their hand to their mouth and now they've got whatever was on that surface, um, which is one of the main reasons that we've been asked to stay home and stay away from other people. Um, and this is very, very important if you consider just in terms of mathematics and how many people you're coming into contact every day. Uh, so if you look on the screen, the R0 equals 3, so R0, um, that is the note, that's how people denote how many people one person can infect. So if it says R0 equals 3, that's saying one person can infect three people. Um, and the coronavirus is thought to infect anywhere from two to three people per person. Um, so if you see the pink circle is somebody who's not really being socially distant, they are going about their regular lives. So they're infecting, one person's affecting about three other people, and that's a lot of cases. Um, whereas the person on the right is only infecting two other people. So that's, it seems like a small difference between infecting two people versus infecting three people, 
But um, as you can see, it makes a really, really big difference once you've put everybody together. And that's, I mean, how our world works. Not all of us live in isolation. We're all constantly coming in contact with other people um, everywhere we go. I'm sure you've also heard of people talk about flattening the curve. Um, and this image kind of explains what they're saying. So if you look um, on one axis, you see the number of cases. So obviously the higher up, that means the more cases that you can get. And then on um, the other axis, you see time since the first case. This is, you know, from left is before, time is going forward in the future. Um, so what people are saying to flatten the curve, it's saying you want to prevent people from everybody getting sick at one time. Now you've got this huge curve that's up high, ton of cases at one single point of time. Flattening the curve really means that you're trying to get it doesn't mean that you're getting less cases. It just means that you're kind of spreading out where those cases are happening so that they're not all happening at the same time. And the reason that this is important is you see the dotted line that says healthcare system capacity. Because we have a very limited amount of beds. We have a very limited amount of hospitals, limited amount of doctors, limited amount of time. We can't afford to have everybody get sick at the same time because you can't treat everybody at the same time. So by flattening the curve, the idea is to spread out when people are getting sick so that they're not getting as sick because we can treat them. Um, we can help them get better before they get really sick. Um, so again, the idea wasn't, oh, we're gonna prevent people from getting sick. We're pretty sure that at some point, everybody's gonna have had the virus at some point. But we're trying to make sure that that burden doesn't end up in the hospitals at the same time. And we kind of have proof that it works. So uh, the in 1918, the Spanish flu was going around the country. And it, on September 28th, so as you can see on the graph in the green, Philadelphia decided that they were going to go ahead and go on, have a parade, because the parade had been scheduled. They'd only had a couple of cases. It's not a big deal. It's fine, right? So they had their parade on September 28th. And you can see how many more cases they had than St. Louis who they had similar amount of cases to begin with, but they immediately started closing things down and initiating social distancing measures. Um, I mean, this is, it's, it was a different time period. Healthcare was different, everything. Um, we handled things very differently, but even just looking at the number of cases and the number of deaths, um, that's a pretty stark image. And even now, if you can see Kentucky and Tennessee, they had um, different policies in place at different times. Um, so by mid-March, Kentucky was getting um, a lot of praise because they had closed down a lot of stuff. So they had closed down stuff and they'd also started testing a lot of people. So it's a combination of closing things down and testing a lot of people. And so they had less numbers of confirmed cases um, and less and more numbers of tests. Um, I don't know if y'all have heard, um, but they had several protests last week um, to open up the to open up the state. Um, and after those protests, numbers have actually gone up. They had their highest daily increase in confirmed cases um, directly following those protests. And if you want to learn more, um, I've included some links to what flattening the curve means, mathematics. Um, about the flu pandemic, and uh, I didn't really touch about the, upon this, but um, how flattening the curve and social distancing affects people, different groups of people differently. Obviously, we've heard about essential workers. Who are those essential workers? How are they different from the general population? And how are things affecting them differently? Something else that's really interesting, um, if any of y'all know about the world of Warcraft, there was a virtual outbreak in the world of Warcraft back in 2006, 2007, um, and they studied how people reacted during that to kind of help us figure out how people would react during the coronavirus pandemic. It's really fascinating. It's a really cool read if you're interested in that. Um, so how is this affecting our mental health? How is being home, how is conduct, um, performing social distancing affecting our mental health? In a ton of ways. Um, we're feeling a lot more lonely and isolated because we're stuck at home. We can't see our friends. We have a lot of anxiety which manifests itself mentally and physically. Uh, we are seeing a rise in people just being distressed all the time, constant trauma. 
We're also having loss of sleep in weird dreams. If you've noticed that you can remember more of your dreams more often or they're re being really weird and it's not how it normally is. This is happening to a lot of people. This is not just you, which is a very interesting phenomena that's, that we're seeing. Um, basically, we're so stressed that our brain doesn't know what to do when we're sleeping and it keeps waking us up because we're so stressed, um, which means that we're having weirder dreams and we're remembering more of them, which is an interesting um, thing that's happening. We're also stressed about school. Um, schools have closed. We're doing everything virtually. Um, our internet might not be working. We might not be able to get our homework in on time, especially, especially for seniors. If you're trying to go to college, a lot of that stuff's been on hold. It's really difficult. We just don't know when schools are opening back up. Um, it's a completely new environment to get teachers and students trying to figure out what's happening. We've also been on social media a lot. Um, we're spending a lot of time on the internet, a lot of time on our phones. And a lot of this has actually kind of been worse for our mental health. Um, it can be helpful. Um, okay, I've had a few people ask, how did it start? Um, I'm assuming you mean how the virus started. Um, so it started in China. That's the first confirmed case of it. Um, and they're thinking that there's a lot of viruses that start um, from an animal that get trans that get transmuted into a um, uh, that mutates into getting into a human. So it's not this is not the first time. If you think about the bird flu and the swine flu, those are both instances that viruses mutate all the time. Their DNA is always changing, and um, it, it just mutated. Things like that happen. Sometimes they don't mutate to make it to humans and sometimes they do. Um, thank you for your question. Um, so I'll go on. The next thing that people are uh, concerned about is just your general health. Um, concerned about, you know, what's your body doing? How, not just how this is affecting you if you get sick, um, but also just in general, uh, being able to go to the doctor, being able to go into the ER. And then people are stressed about being stuck at home, being stuck with your parents, being stuck with your family, or if you can't be with your family if you're stuck at school, or being stuck where you can't see your friends, or if, you know, if your parents are always working, or if your parents are always home. There's just so many situations that are happening that we don't really know. It's a person-by-person -person basis, which makes it really, really difficult to talk about and to have these conversations, especially when Everybody is going through something similar and everybody is going through something different. Um, and you want to be able to talk with your friends about it or with your teachers or um, any other adult in your life. You, you want to be able to talk about it, but part of it is you don't want to burden whoever you're talking about it with, or if you're stressed out, you might not have words to talk about it. Uh, you might want to suppress what's happening and not really take the time to, you might not be able to take the time to process what's happening, which is all completely normal. There is no right way, there is no wrong way to really deal with how all of this is affecting us. This is completely new. We have not before shut down schools in this way. We have not had to deal with anything um, on this scale. So anything that you're feeling is completely normal. Um, so I'm gonna give you a couple of tips for how we can kind of work on our mental health. Um, and these are gonna be individual tips, things that you can do. Uh, the biggest one I'm gonna say is set a routine. I know that that's really hard because nothing else is really scheduled, but really setting a routine is very important. And it doesn't have to be the same time. It doesn't have to be based on your school schedule. Um, you don't have to go to sleep at eight o'clock every night. You don't have to wake up at eight o'clock every morning. Um, you really should just figure out what works for you. If you're a night person, maybe you stay up a couple nights and you uh, wake up later. If you're a morning person, you go to bed early and you wake up earlier. The point is for you to figure out what works for you and then to stick with it, to make a schedule, to try and go to sleep and wake up around the same time every day. Also make sure you're eating and you're eating around the same times. You're having, if you can, a breakfast, a lunch, a dinner, if you're able to have several snacks, please do. Listen to your body, listen to what you need and try to set a routine. Don't go the most of the day without eating. Um, I have, like I said, I have younger brothers and they will wake up around noon and then not eat until three. Um, don't do that. <laughs> please um, set a routine for when, you, when you're eating. And when you're gonna go to school, 
I know for me, I'm not in school right now, I'm working, but it's really stressful to figure out, to think that I have to be on all the time or that I have to be at work all the time. Or if I miss an hour of work, I have to make it up later. Really, um, if you set a routine, you can tell yourself, you know, I'm gonna work for three hours and that's it, whatever gets done, gets done. And if it doesn't get done, you know, be, grac be gracious with yourself and give yourself time to do it later. Um, and talk to your teacher if you're having a hard time, they'll completely understand. Um, and also work out, uh, go outside for some time. Don't touch people, don't touch things, um, stay six feet away. But you know, get some exercise, go out in nature. If you have time to walk, please walk. Um, or even do exercise at home, just move around, do something with your body. Uh, it releases endorphins and it makes you feel better. Um, and then also setting boundaries is very important. Set boundaries with your friends, set boundaries with your parents. This can be physical boundaries. Um, I know that everybody being at home is very stressful and you have limited space, uh, but try to have those conversations about, you know, if your room is your room, are your parents allowed in your room? Are your siblings allowed in your room? Um, when can they come in? When do they have to ask permission? But also, uh, texting, you know, when are you going to be texting your friends? How long can your friends expect you to text back or having phone calls? Um, what kind of, when are you, when are your friends allowed to call you and when is it okay for them to not call you? Uh, or you'll, you'll call them back later. Um, and on that subject, do reach out to loved ones. You reach out to your friends, reach out to your family, whether it's people you've talked to normally or people you don't talk to normally. Um, so on that subject, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, support. So this is peer support, social support. It's a complete field in public health. I'm only going to touch a little bit on it. Um, so basically being supportive uh, for somebody, um, there's five different ways that we talk about support. One is just being there for somebody. Another way is helping somebody really manage their life or manage what's happening. Um, another way is providing social and emotional support, which is kind of usually what we really think of support. Um, you know, talking with people, listening to their problems, you know, problem solving together. Another is linking to actual resources. Um, if you know of some kind of resources, letting your friends get in on that, um, sharing links, um, all of that stuff. And then ongoing support is really just those touch points, like keep in touch with your friends friends and keep doing that, keep being there for them. Um, and then I have some other very specific examples for how we can support each other. Um, I'm just going to go through them pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, be kind to yourself, care for yourself, um, give yourself some slack because you're doing your best and your best is okay. Uh, don't expect your best to be whatever it was before um, the pandemic was happening. Think about who you could be reaching out to and reach out to them. Ask about their families, ask about their loved ones, ask very obvious questions, check in with people who are sick. Um, you know, prioritize reaching out and making sure that you're not just staying home or staying and, and staying within yourself. Uh, and pay it forward, ask them to reach out to somebody else who they might not have been talking to. Um, your role as a supportive friend is to be a friend. You don't have to have the answers. You just have to reach out to somebody. Um, share your own experiences to help people be comfortable with sharing their experience, but also give them room to talk and don't monopolize the conversation. Ask open-ended questions instead of closed questions, which could be like yes or no. You really want to ask questions that they could respond to, um, have a longer response. Um, and then small gestures mean a lot, you know, small texts, small, send your friends some memes. That's what my brothers do. They just send each other memes all the time. Um, they get on video games and play together. Um, those are just some small examples for how you can reach out to your friends. Uh, so another resource uh, that I found as I was doing my research, um, it's this app called Real Talk. They're, nor they're created to do um, kind of like sexual education for teenagers, but they really opened up into um, helping kids, helping teenagers talk about, you know, coronavirus. So they've created this guide on how to stay happy and healthy, but they're also opening up their app um, to actually talk to teens and help teens get through what's happening. Um, so that's it. That's all that I have. So again, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. Um, and also you can send me an email and I will answer whenever you do.
Right. Good job, Joanna. Really enjoyed that. So we actually do have some questions, but I'm going to start off first with uh, a comment. One of our um, participants, actually, his mom went to um, your school, Concord High School. Um, it, uh, her name was Carolyn Lucas. So yeah, super cool, fun oh, fact oh, there. Oh, yeah. small world. I love the spiders. <laughs> yeah. Um, not to be confused with Richmond spiders. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to ask two of them here. So um, one of them kind of dovetails on what you were just um, talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and this one's actually my question. So what advice would you give teens or even adults for, um, because there's different types of people out there. There are some people that use this time in quarantine as like, oh, I'm going to get fit. This is my time to get fit and eat right. Or this is my time to clean my whole house. Or this is my time to do this. Uh, what do you think about that? And is it okay to just be? And is that okay? Like, uh, what's your advice to teens that are struggling with that balance? And what do you think they should be doing? Um, I think you should listen to yourself. Um, listen to what you want to do. And don't let people kind of dictate what you feel you should be doing. Um, for some of us, the way that we're coping with this is we want to go, 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 go. So like you said, you want to get fit, you want to clean your house, you want to do this, you have all of this free time and you want to just do something. Um, so a lot of people are using this time to really just get things done and just be as productive as they can be and do things. Um, but it is just as likely that you might wake up one morning and you just want to stay in bed. You just want to lay there. You just want to watch TV, read a book. Both are completely fine. It's whatever feels comfortable to you. And I know that, um, you know, school might be closed, but they're still asking you to do lots of virtual activities, virtual assignments. Um, and for some people, it's a nice break to, you know, get on your computer and like get focused on something that's external to you. Um, and that can feel really good to get that assignment done. But for probably just as many of you, that's really stressful. It makes you feel really anxious. Um, you really don't want to do that. Um, what I can say is a lot of schools have been really, really supportive over, you know, what works for you. And if you reach out to your teachers, just let them know, you know, I'm having a hard time getting out of bed. I'm having a hard time, you know, sitting down and doing this. I can't concentrate. Completely okay. Just let somebody know. Um, tell your parents, tell your teachers, just let people know what's happening. Talk to them about what's happening um, and that you don't feel like you can do it. Completely okay, but you should let people know because they can help you or they can, you know, change the assignment for you. Um, you can turn it in later. Uh, they can do a different assignment, something that you can do, but just be very open and talk about your feelings and talk about how you want to proceed. I'm really glad you said that because I know so many teens right now are like, oh my gosh, I need to be studying for my SATs. I need to be studying for ACTs or I need to apply or research all these colleges, but it is okay. I'm glad to hear that it's okay that they don't need to do that. They need to listen to themselves. So that's really good advice. So we can start chilling out and being kind to ourselves. I like that. Yeah. Um, so, oh, oh, uh, I was just commenting real quick. Um, yeah, I've seen a lot on like Instagram posts and it's just like that hustle culture where you're like, if you're not maximizing all your downtime now, then you're wasting it. It's like, well, no, like you still need to kind of take care of yourself. So yes, great, excellent advice. I think yeah. everybody needs to hear it. <laughs> like and if I that works for you, great. Pursue your dreams to the end of the earth. But if you need to take a day, take a couple days, just chill. <laughs> so true. And like that go, go, go culture, that's 100% me, like during non-quarantine, but I've done the exact opposite. I've like stopped, so, and that's okay. Um, so we do have a question from Savvy and Jazzy. Um, so I, I'm gonna, uh, hopefully I interpret this question correctly. So uh, pertaining to you, Joanna, what if you had COVID-19, what would you do? If I had COVID-19, um, so I would, um, so I'm lucky enough that I have a job um, and my job still stands. And so I still have insurance. Um, and what a lot of the advice has been is if you have the symptoms, um, however, you're not having trouble breathing, um, even if you have a fever or you have a cough, 
uh, they ask that you stay home, especially if you're young and you're not immunocompromised, which I am not immunocompromised. Um, then they ask that you stay home, you stay away from if you're at home with your family, which I am to stay in a room by yourself. Um, so you kind of prevent the spread. Um, and really, you should only be going to the doctor if you are having trouble breathing, um, or you're immunocompromised, which a lot of people are. Um, so that's what I would do if I had it. So you don't have to go unless you're like really having trouble. You don't have to go to the hospital, meaning unless you really ha are having trouble. Right. Um, that's one of the symptoms that uh, that's when you would really need to go. And and even if you, if you have a fever for a certain amount of days, but there's a lot of resources, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, um, they have several flow charts that you can actually look at your symptoms and it'll tell you at which point you should be going to the doctor. So if you're concerned that you or a family member has it, I would recommend going to the Centers for Disease Control website, looking up the symptoms, and it'll tell you very, very specifically what symptoms you could be having and at what symptoms you would need to go to the doctor for. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Michelle. If you're self-quarantining at home, assuming you think you have the virus, should you block airways like air vents since it could be airborne? Um, so this is a common misconception. So the uh, virus is actually not airborne. Um, airborne means would mean that you could get it, for, like it'd be transmitted through the air. Um, like I said, this is actually found in water droplets. And as you know, water is heavier than air. So water would actually, the water droplets are landing on things. They're landing on people, they're landing on surfaces. Um, so you really don't have to block any air vents or any airways because it is an airborne. Um, this is why they're asking people to wash their hands and to wash all the surfaces. Make sure you wash your hands for 20 seconds. And this is because that's as long as it takes for the soap um, to kind of enter and kill and destroy the viruses that could be alive on your hands. Um, 20 seconds with warm water. So you don't even have to use hand sanitizer. Soap is actually kind of better for you. Um, and then wipe down all surfaces, but you do not have to close down any air vents um, because it is not airborne. I think we have time for probably one more question if anybody wants to jump in. Um, if not, I am certainly curious about how they use world of warcraft um to kind of predict what would happen with the COVID 19. <laughs> um so i you should definitely look it up it's really really fascinating so what happened um world of warcraft is an online um role-playing game uh basically you have your own avatar which means like you have your own person you can go online you are playing with other people um you're playing like in the world um, and you have your own quest, you kind of can do whatever you um, want to do. So one of the quests that was happening in 2006 or 2007 was there was like this bad guy, you know, this big bad guy, you had to go destroy the bad guy. Um, but one of his powers was to kind of give you a blood disease. So it was a blood virus. Um, so the idea was you're fighting the bad guy and the bad guy infects you and now your, your, you know, your blood is draining out. So you're losing your life points. And the idea was that you would stay and fight before your life ran out. And then if you died, you died and you had to come back. Um, but if you won, then you only had until your life ran out. So that was the idea. Um, and when they created it, they actually made it so you can infect other people. So if you're with a group of people, they only had to infect one and then that person could infect you know, the team of players. Um, but what actually ended up happening is people got the blood disease, they saw their life draining, they panicked, and so they quit, and they like left the room with the bad guy, and they went to home, or they went to other places in the game. But because they were still infected, now they were infecting people at home, or they were infecting people, you know, at other places of the game. And even if you quit, you were still infected, so when you logged back on, you were now infecting whoever you were around. 
Um, and because they also made it so like your dog companion or like your pet companion could also get infected. Now, if you left and you took your dog with you and your dog was hanging out, like now they were infecting other people. Um, and everybody kept getting infected. And instead of, you know, losing and then, you know, dying because people didn't want to die, um, they kept panicking and infecting more people, which is kind of how we saw like humans reacting to real life pandemics. You know, somebody gets sick, their instinct is to go home. Their instinct is to leave whatever's happening and to like go be with their friends, go be with their family, you know, be sur surround yourselves by the, what you're comfortable with. Um, whereas, you know, the advice is if you think you're sick, you should actually stay by yourself and like don't infect other people. Um, so that's it's how, <laughs> yeah. And so because again, it's an online game, they were actually able to like track players and like see, you know, th this point, this player got infected. What did they do next? Where did they go? What was their wow. instinct? Um, and so that psychologists were using it to study kind of the human behavior um, response. I wonder, so my, I, my understanding of World of Warcraft is like pretty rudimentary, but from my understanding, they have guilds that are actually like pretty organized and like they can kind of like coordinate what they're going to be doing and like what missions they want to adopt. Did they find that they were better suited to like preventing the spread of the disease by being like, oh, you have the disease, stop, 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 stop. Just go get out, like isolate yourself. Or is it just well, kind of a, do they not have that data? <laughs> Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if the, art, the article that I read might not have gone into that. Um, but people just didn't know what it was. This had never happened before. It's an online video game. Uh, you just didn't know. So like they thought if I exit the game, you know, if I turn the game on and off again, I'll be better. And that's not how it worked. Um, and like the servers actually crashed because everybody was dying and they had to like wipe out all of the servers and like restart the game back up because that is how seriously everybody got infected and like they just had no idea it just it just happened i think i remember that that was the year i graduated high school so uh <laughs> um wow. i mean i had like some friends that played but yikes that's insane and just think that's kind of like the turning off on and off the game is kind of like when you don't feel good and you're like oh i'm just gonna go to sleep i'll be better in the morning and like <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> insane <laughs> Um, we do have another question here. Um, will there be a recession after this? Um, unfortunately, I do not know very much about economics. <laughs> um, so I, I, I honestly don't know. I couldn't really tell you. Um, I think that it's a big fear that's happening. Um, uh, any economic repercussions that are happening. Um, but I do want to say that at least to me personally, um, saving lives is a little bit more important than how much money we're going to be making. Um, the hardest part about saying that statement is that unfortunately the way that our system, that our, all of our infrastructures are set up, um, they kind of hurt the people who need the help the most. Um, so that's poor people, people of color, people in rural communities. Um, they have the least resources and in times of economic recessions, they get hit the hardest. Um, you know, the rich people tend to keep their money because of how it's invested um, and because of how we f structure our bailouts and who we decide to bail out um, versus the people who actually need the help, the people who need the money, the people who need the jobs, you know, they have the hardest time coming back from things like that. Um, and I think that a recession is entirely possible. The way that we're looking at things, it's completely possible that we're going to have um, who knows what the job market's going to look like when things open back up, but we really should be concerned about helping people who need the help the most rather than helping the economy, which tends to be the people who already have money and don't really need help. That's all I will say about that. And I will say like personal experience. Um, so I can't speak for everybody, but like I did live through one recession cause I'm ancient. Um, but I was a senior in college through our last recession in 2008. So everybody was very worried. There was not very many jobs, but it's okay. Like I'm okay. The, my peers that graduated from college, yeah, they struggled a little bit finding a job, but eventually they found a job. We bounced back. Um, as you can see, I work at Moorhead. So it's, it's not, 
totally the end of the world and not something that we need to be super fearful at the moment. Just think about what, what your needs are. You, you have a roof over your head, you're able to eat, you're, fa- you're healthy and your family's healthy. Just keep those things in mind. You can control that. Um, you can't control other things around you. So it's good to keep in mind during a recession if that does happen. All right, so that is about all the time we have. Um, Joanna, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Tamara, thanks again for helping us moderate. And Kim, thanks for helping on the back end of the webinar system. And everybody, thank you for tuning in. I think this should be posted online eventually. Um, And then next week, we will be joined by Lauren McRae, and she'll be talking about what climate scientists are working on to combat climate change over the next 10 years. So it should be a good one. Be sure to tune in at 5 o'clock next Thursday. All right. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. everybody.